born in Wimbledon. Uh, Kemi spent most of her childhood in Nigeria before returning to the UK age 16. Her conservatism, she said, stemmed partly from the fact she was unlucky enough to live under socialist policies and saw the damage they caused. More recently, uh, Kemi ran for the conservative leadership in the past but one contest, uh, that was the one after Boris Johnson's ejection that Liz Truss ultimately won. And she really defied expectations as a recently uh, elected MP being eliminated in the fourth round. And what was clear was that if she'd have gotten to the final two and it had gone to conservative members, she was the clear favorite among the conservative base, often by double digit margins. And that's because she was seen as providing an authentic message that married economic liberalism, that's in the good classical sense, uh, with a respect for and defense of British institutions and a critique of the more extreme ends of progressivism. Indeed, despite being a small stater, she said in her maiden speech in the House of Commons that a defense of liberty today needed to be broader than just the economic realm, saying, I believe in free markets and free trade, but there is more to conservatism than economic liberalism. There is respect for the rule of law, personal responsibility, freedom of speech and of association and opportunity. Those freedoms are being subtly eroded in an era when emotion and feeling are prized above logic and reason. It is those freedoms that I will seek to defend during my time in this house. Well, Kemi, we are glad that somebody is defending uh, those principles in the House of Commons. Welcome to the Cato Institute, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Ryan. That's a fantastic uh, and accurate introduction, which doesn't always happen when I, when I give these speeches. So, so thank you. And it's a real pleasure to be speaking uh, this evening at the Cato Institute. Uh, and it's lovely to see so many people uh, who've come to listen to what I have to say on trade. Um, so I've been in the role of Trade Secretary for two months now, under two prime ministers. And uh, there is a tendency when speaking to think tanks to talk about the importance of free trade. But this is the Cato Institute. And if I have to explain to this audience why free trade is important, then we have some very serious problems. So instead, I'd like to talk very personally about what free markets and free trade mean to me. Uh, many of you may not know, but um, actually you do know now, sorry, this is me reading the speech, you do know because Ryan just said so, that I grew up in Nigeria and uh, moved to the UK when I was 16. I was, born, I was born in the UK, but that was because my mother had an obstetric referral. So I was there for about two weeks and then moved back. That's, that's why I was born in the UK. But I never lived there, I didn't know the country. Uh, where I did grow up had military governments, and so I have a first-hand experience of authoritarianism and protectionism, uh, that I think is quite unique, and it's unique not just in the UK, but in what we call the West today. Uh, I think it's actually quite extraordinary that I'm standing here in front of you as the UK's Trade Secretary, but here I am, and here's what I want you to know. When I talk about a belief in free trade, it's not empty rhetoric. I'm speaking from personal experience about what happens when you don't have it. I've seen what happens when a nation can't trade or worse, embraces protectionism. The result isn't growth and the nurturing of local industries, which is always the excuse that people give. The result is poverty and the very best of a country's talent leaving to find opportunities elsewhere. And people worry about the free market and they talk about it as if it's an uncontrolled experiment. But the market is people having the freedom to make choices to improve their lives. It does need good regulation so that people don't cheat the system. Uh, it needs good regulation to, uh, to prevent unfair trading practices, monopolies, and exploitation of consumers. So it's not an untrammeled free market, but we do, need, uh, we do need to have free trade and free markets because when you don't, weird things happen. So I talk about things that I saw growing up. For example, when the government wanted to improve the tomato industry in Nigeria, and so it banned tomato imports. And what didn't happen was loads of farmers deciding to grow tomatoes 
what instead happened was tomatoes becoming like diamonds in terms of how hard it was to get them. The supply dried up completely, the prices went up. Uh, big companies that use tomatoes as an ingredient uh, cornered the market and people who needed to use them to just make food, caterers, restaurants, people who, for whom that was almost the only vegetable they had, couldn't access, couldn't access it because that's not how you grow a local industry. And I saw it happen over and over again with finance, capital controls, uh, turning the currency into waste paper effectively, or a story I love to tell about when the government banned rice imports and uh, rice became a black market product. And when my mother came to visit me in London, her suitcase uh, when she came to London was not full of things from Harrods and Hamleys. It was full of Tesco Value rice, which she'd packed right up to fill her entire suitcase. For those of you who know what I mean by Tesco Value rice, it became a very, very precious commodity. That's what a lack of free trade and free markets creates. And there are dozens and dozens of examples that I could give. But like I said, at Cato, I shouldn't have to explain why, um, why that is. But the reason why um, I talk about it is because I'm fighting for something that I really believe in. Uh, free markets and free trade make the world a better place. And that is the only purpose to becoming a politician. Nothing else matters. So why has the world become more protectionist? I think that's a more interesting question rather than telling, uh, preaching to the choir about um, the benefits of free trade and free markets. Why has the world become more protectionist? Everyone here knows that protection protectionism is not the answer. And uh, the US and the UK have done a lot to expand the concept of free trade, especially in the last 75 years. We founded the multilateral trading system with our allies, and our transatlantic partnership embodies why free trade works and why it matters so much. But one of the many reasons why I'm so frustrated by the trope that Brexit was the UK retreating from the world is because it is completely untrue. I voted to leave the European Union, and I saw Brexit as a once-in-a-generation opportunity for the UK to embrace the world. And trade was, and still is, at the heart of that. So why does it feel like everyone is becoming more protectionist? And the answer is uncertainty. We live in uncertain times. A global pandemic that changed our understanding of the world, Russia's war in Ukraine, and a more assertive China are just three of the things that are making people more fearful about the future relatively low economic growth in the West over recent decades compared to what people are used to has also caused part of this problem. So what can we do? What do we need to provide more security for the people of the world? That relative low economic growth uh, is, is absolutely terrifying. And uh, for those people who saw the post-war uh, post 20th century, it makes a lot of our contemporaries feel poorer than they actually are. And you compound that with the belief that jobs are being taken away either by technology or by offshoring, and it's no surprise that the in instinct is to protect what we have. So if we are going to make people feel less protectionist, we're going to have to make them feel more secure first, and we need to show how free trade and free markets, when done properly, do provide security. So trade as a tool of security is at the very heart of the trade policy that I'm going to be pushing as uh, the UK's Trade Secretary. So the US and the UK can provide security and indeed certainty by doing three things. One, investing in the future, not just the present. Two, securing and diversifying supply chains, which means more trade, not less. And three, deepening international partnerships, which is one of the reasons why I am here. So here are some examples of how we're doing this in the UK in just one area. So let's talk about climate change uh, as an example. Two weeks ago, I launched the UK's Green Trade and Investment Expo, securing millions of pounds that will grow the UK economy and create jobs across the industries of the future. We all know that climate change is a challenge for us all, wherever we live in the world, but we know that we can and should solve it by using free trade and investment to accelerate the technological progress that will protect the planet. And something that's, that not enough politicians say we must do this, we must protect the planet in a way that does not impoverish the UK, the US, or let's be honest, any other country. I talked then about securing and diversifying supply chains. We will need this to improve energy security globally. So back home in Europe, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made it clear that relying on authoritarian regimes for energy is not sustainable. 
Doing so has made it harder and more expensive to heat our homes, and the ensuing energy crisis has increased inflations to levels not seen in recent memory. So our trade relationships will help secure our energy supply, but it's long-term investment in nuclear, in renewables, in democratic countries that will reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and keep down consumer costs. And trade is more than selling each other goods and services. It is also about foreign direct investment. Technological investment creates the jobs of tomorrow. And as I said to all those investors who came to the expo from around the world, including the US, uh, investments can future-proof the economy if we get it right. More importantly, as we're seeing in the UK, it drives economic growth and keeps communities alive. Communities such as Blythe in the northeast of England, which was a coal mining town once in decline, but it is now thriving as it becomes one of the UK's most important bases for offshore wind and is driving the clean energy revolution, funded by investors from across the world, including here. And that's just on climate change. And now that we've left the European Union we have an, and have an independent trade policy, what does this look like in practice? Well. We're using our new freedoms to negotiate new trade deals and upgrade existing ones, deepening our ties with our allies while creating new economic partnerships. We're joining the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP, as um, we call it. It's a network of 11 countries spanning from Asia to the Americas, it's got Canada and Mexico in it, uh, maybe the US someday. But it covers, at the moment, half a billion people. And we're strengthening our relationships with our partners and allies in the Indo-Pacific, a region that will be responsible for half of global growth in the coming decades. We're thinking about the future. We're in talks on a free trade deal with India. India is a country that's going to be the world's third largest economy by 2050. We're acting to protect global supply chains after COVID-19 and, of course, after the invasion of Ukraine revealed so many vulnerabilities. And what do we want from the US? Well, we've made no secret that we want to deepen trade, uh, trade ties through a comprehensive free trade agreement. So those of you who want more free trade with the UK, please write to your congressman. Um, and I heard that there's some new ones this week. Uh, but the lack of a free trade agreement is no barrier to boosting trade. Our trading relationship with the US was worth over $250 billion over the past 12 months. So we are each other's number one source of foreign direct investment. More than 1.2 million Americans work for UK companies in the United States. And every day, just under one and a half million Brits go to work for an American firm. So the UK has been nimble and innovative in finding other ways of working with you beyond free trade agreements. For instance, we're signing a memorandum of understanding on a statewide level. In May, we signed uh, one on trade and economic cooperation with Indiana. That's a state that already buys $1.4 billion worth of UK goods every year. North Carolina followed in July. And my team is securing others and looking to sign even more. So as I said, I'm here to continue deepening our international partnership. Our trading relationship does not build itself. We need to work at it. And that doesn't just mean giving speeches about how much we love each other. It also sometimes means fixing problems and offering challenge when required. So while I'm here, I'll also be raising our concerns about the Inflation Reduction Act. We know that this was a strategic st uh, step to protect the US economy. And we also know that there'll be many people in DC and across the country who support it. But it's important that these measures don't conflate long-standing allies and partners like the UK with those other countries that might want to damage U US interests. So I'm sure everyone here knows the ins and outs of the Inflation Reduction Act. However, you may not know that the substantial uh, new tax credits for electric cars not only bar, uh, bars vehicles made in the UK from the US market, but it also affects vehicles made in the US by UK manufacturers. So the investment in innovation taking place in the UK should be helping the US with tomorrow's challenges. U.S. businesses already have over $500 billion invested in our economy. That's more than anywhere else in the world. And to put that figure into context, it's more than Sweden's annual GDP. So it's one thing if over the long, long term, one country locks out its friends to compete uh, with opponents, but it's another if you're locking out the investment made by your own companies. And those same opponents that I just mentioned don't hesitate to use strong arm tactics to create geopolitical divides and to threaten and coerce smaller economies. 
So if the US and the UK are to future-proof ourselves and our allies against a changing world, we need to approach trade in a more muscular way. As world-leading centers for strategic industries, we need to develop trade policy that reflects how global commerce is evolving, is evolving. And we need to use it to fight even harder for the ideas and values that underpin our democracies and economies. And we must help each other to do that. So that means working together to shape the rules that govern global commerce before those who want to grab control and stifle free trade get there first. Protecting intellectual property rights is one example. Both our economies were built on the work of inventors and entrepreneurs. And intellectual property rights drive the innovation, they incentivize inventors, they protect and reward their ideas. And if we conflate the ideas of intellectual property with protectionism, we risk choking off innovation. So it's important that the UK and the US work together to champion the multilateral rules-based system, upholding the, interne uh, the international intellectual property rights framework, and with every trade barrier that falls and every contract that gets signed between businesses, opportunity and prosperity increases around the world. And this means democracy flourishes and the case for autocracy diminishes. There is an exciting future ahead for us both in terms of UK-US trade cooperation. I'm thrilled to be part of that and to be working with you here in Washington and also across the US. And I look forward to a shared transatlantic future filled with even more friendship, economic cooperation, and mutual success. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kemi. Um, we'll just have a short time of modified kind of Q&A uh, from me. Moderated, not modified. Uh, maybe it'll be modified, I don't know. I've got my questions here. Um, so you talked a lot in those remarks about security. Uh, with any change of prime minister, change of government, uh, you'll have some people who will use that as an opportunity to perhaps push their kind of vested interests, say that it's essential for security, that a certain product is protected. I think we've seen some of that in the House of Commons today. So just to be kind of clear, is, is one of your priorities still liberalization or is it security instead of liberalization? It's both. So liberalizing in the right way. There is no point liberalizing uh, your economy to the point where people who are playing by different rules are able to exploit it. That's not what um, free trade and free markets is about, which is why I made the point about regulation. Regulation is absolutely critical, and it means, every, it means creating a level playing field, everyone playing by the same rules, not the unfair trading practices that we've seen, not dumping products in other people's economies. But in order to liberalize, we need to make the argument about why free trade and free markets work. At the moment, I don't think we're making the argument as well as we could do. And one of the things that I'm hoping I'll be able to do is just talk more and explain more and be better rather than just repeat the cliche. It's not enough to say free trade, free markets over and over again. We have to show people how it works, why it works, and we also need to play by the rules as well. So one of the concerns a lot of people have, even you know, the most ardent free traders, uh, is China. Um, and I think a lot of people recognize some of the problems there in regards to intellectual property and, and some of the other things that you spoke about. How far do you think um, uh, your kind of strategy in dealing with these problems is something that will occur bilaterally or working at the multilateral level? Obviously, the WTO doesn't seem to be working as well as perhaps it once did. You know, what ambitions do you guys have in terms of your participation at that level, at the multilateral level? Uh, so we have to we have to do everything uh, that we can. So all of those things, there's no strategy that's been uh, rejected. It's a multi-strategy approach. So at a bilateral level, me being here, talking to your legislators, talking about what we can do in order to strengthen that international property framework, and I'd be doing that with many other countries. But at every opportunity where we have a, multi a, a multilateral platform, we need to do that, even with the WTO. Giving up on the WTO is not, um, in my view, the, the answer. It's finding ways of working better with the people who are, part, with, with the countries that are participating there. It'll be a different argument, it'll be a different approach. So for instance, uh, on, uh, the, on trips, 
which was the, uh, the issue that we had around COVID vaccines, we did come to a resolution. There has to be some give and take, but we know that without the innovation that comes from uh, the work that's done with, with pharma, for example, the whole world will suffer. Those countries that want to make generic drugs will not have anything to uh, copy if the innovation isn't happening in countries like the UK and US, which do lead in this, um, on, the, on this front. So we have to make sure that we are making a cogent argument and showing that the rules which we're putting in place or which we're pushing for benefit everybody, not just ourselves. And that way we'll be able to bring other people along with us. I think many people in this room will be really, really heartened to hear that um, the long-term goal is still a US-UK free trade agreement. Obviously, that's something that was talked about a lot in the immediate aftermath of uh, Brexit. I believe the former Prime Minister, uh, Liz Truss, kind of said it was perhaps not on the agenda in the near term. What do you see as the kind of key barriers there? Obviously, um, Democrats seem to have other priorities right now uh, here in the US, but I think it's fair to say there'd be political challenges with that type of deal at home. So what do you see as the main barriers to that and how do you think we might overcome them? Um, so, th so the barriers are across the whole world, and this is why I was talking about protectionism. It's not just, the, it's not just in the US uh, where we see people wanting to move away from free trade agreements. We need to address the reasons why they're moving away uh, from, from these sorts of agreements before we can push for them. And the reasons why are because many people believe that it's the free trade agreements that are responsible for them losing their jobs for offshoring, uh, even when it's not, it's not the case, even when it's technology that's just changed how things work. So again, explaining, showing, uh, convincing, persuading is all part of the work that needs to be done. But the, we, we have to remember it's not just in the US where there is uh, you know, some kind of hostility. Even in the UK, there are still people who don't want to hear about free trade agreements because uh, bizarrely, everybody wants to sell to another country, but they don't want other countries to, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, to, to, to sell back. And we have to remind people that markets uh, are a form of exchange. And we, uh, I think, will get to a place where we will get more sort of free trade agreements with lots of countries. But we also shouldn't get too hung up on these FTAs. They are just one type of tool uh, for trade. And they're very easy to, for people to remember because people see uh, the two heads of state or heads of government signing a document and so on. But the US is the biggest investor in the UK and vice versa, and we don't have an FTA. So an FTA is an easy way of removing those barriers, whether they're tariff or non-tariff barriers. But they are rarely full sort of comprehensive free trade um, uh, agreements where there's absolutely nothing preventing trade between the two places. And um, FTAs are also quite underdeveloped on services, where the UK, 70% of our economy is services-based. So having services-based uh, agreements, uh, we did one with Singapore on digital trade recently. There are lots of different things that can be done, not just the FTA. But the, um, the point I would want to make is about making sure that we are still liberalizing but may, and not punishing like-minded countries. If uh, we have a situation where the US creates rules that are uh, effectively closing other markets off, like um, the example I gave of the Inflation Reduction Act, that will be bad for the US in the long term. The same with the UK. So we need to remember to take our friends and allies with us even as we're making strategic moves um, against other, other parts of the world. I think you'll find many friends here who argued against the Inflation Reduction Act for, for other reasons as, as well. Um, I want to shift gears a bit. Uh, Cato's a libertarian think tank. You've talked in your maiden speech in Parliament about threats to liberty. In your opinion, what is the biggest threat to liberty broadly defined in the UK? Uh, there's so many. Uh, it's, you know, I, c I could be here all all evening. Um, but one of the things I like talking about now, this is a new thing, I, I talk about um, the, the loss of epistemic authority. <laughs> and it's You're going to have to explain that one to me. It's, 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 uh, basically, it's, it's how I describe people not knowing what is true and what is false. 
And I think that is a huge uh, problem for those of us who believe in liberty. Because when people, are, uh, when people can't tell what's true or what's false, they move into a space where they're worried about how they feel and how things make them feel. And they look to restrict free speech. Uh, in particular, which means that you don't have the debate, you don't get the ideas, you don't challenge, you don't challenge the problems. I think that that's one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest um, uh, challenges for liberty today. And also people uh, not understanding, and, and the reason what that leads to is people not understanding that liberty isn't the freedom to harm others it's actually the freedom from harm as well and from others harming you. So when I look at the arguments a lot of young people make today, uh, I call them new authoritarians, people who want to stop everything and ban everything. Usually the sentiment's coming from, from a good place, but actually they are trying to create uh, safetyism, a world where nothing, nothing bad happens and they see liberty as a, as a challenge to that when actually liberty is the thing that protects us all. I think one of the you're Minister for Women and Equalities. Um, one of the difficulties is quite often it's quite ill-defined what kind of absolute equality would look like. Are we talking about equality of opportunity? Are we talking about equality of outcome? Equality under the law? There are very different concepts. What does the concept of equality kind of mean to you uh, as part of your role? So within my role, uh, the, 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 the word equalities, I think, is used slightly differently. So the Minister for Equalities, uh, which in, in and of itself is sort of a weird grammatical thing, uh, is the minister who guards the Equality Act. And the Equality Act is an anti-discrimination it's a piece of legislation that is about anti-discrimination. So it's not about equality of outcome. Uh, it does try to provide more equality of opportunity, but the the way I express it to many people who I think don't really understand what it's there for is that the Equality Act is a shield, not a sword. So it is there to protect people from harm and it protects all people. So there are nine protected characteristics such as race, uh, sex, religion and so on but it protects you as a white man in the same way that it protects me as a black woman. What many people mistake the Equality Act for is an act that protects certain groups. This is an act that protects uh, ethnic minorities or it protects women and so on. It protects everybody irrespective of um, their race, their class, uh, their, well, it doesn't ha actually have class specifically as a protected characteristic, but their race, their economic um, situation is something that's often correlated with that, their religion and uh, the remaining nine characteristics. So making sure that the act uh, stops people from being discriminated against while stopping other people who would want to use it to uh, engineer particular outcomes is, is the challenge and is quite often where many of the tensions arise. In your um, conservative leadership campaign, uh, you can't choose how you're kind of dubbed by m much of the media, but at various times y you were dubbed a culture warrior. Mm. Is that a, a badge of honor or is that something that you would kind of highly challenge? Um, I don't know. I think it depends on who I'm talking to. Uh, but it's, it's one of the things that's very difficult being a politician where other people try and write your story for you and it, you lose control of your own narrative. So people say that I'm a culture warrior, but the, the, and that's because of the things that I talked about in my job. But the reason why I talked about those things was because it was my job. I was the minister responsible for protecting uh, everyone, irrespective of their sexual orientation, irrespective of their sex, or their race. But those are all the contentious issues that, um, that we see today. So the very fact that I was talking about them meant that I would be badged as a culture warrior unless, unless I probably took the most progressive line to take on those issues. But I'm a conservative, which meant that I took the conservative line on many of those issues, and that's why I'm badged as a culture warrior. And what's really odd is that many of the things that I say now were socially liberal positions, not that, not that long ago. I see myself very much as a classical liberal. But because uh, we keep moving uh, socially in a particular direction, uh, and I call it progressivism, the people who take the progressive line will assume that my, me trying to keep make, maintain a conservative line makes me a culture warrior. I don't know. I, I'm just trying to do the right thing. 
you know, I, I totally understand that. I feel the same way on a lot of economic issues. I don't feel like my views have changed, but I feel like the surrounding world has, uh, has changed quite a bit mm. uh, in the opposite direction. Um, you said in a couple of interviews in the past that one of your intellectual inspirations is Tom Sowell, mm -hmm. someone who'd be very familiar to many uh, people in this room. Can you just explain a bit about how he influenced you, which works influenced you? Uh, I, I stumbled on Tom Sowell by accident. So uh, it, it was 2004, 2005, and I remember having an argument with someone in the workplace, and uh, I just thought, I don't really know anything about economics. I'm an engineer by training. I studied engineering. I hadn't done any kind of training in economics. So I went um, onto Amazon and just Googled basic economics as uh, those two keywords, and the first thing that came up was a Thomas Sowell book, and it had good reviews, so I ordered it, and it was absolutely brilliant. It was so readable, it was so interesting, and I think it was about five years later that I realized that Thomas Sowell was black. I had no idea because there was no picture of him on the, on the book that I'd ordered, but I didn't understand why he was someone who wasn't fated much more than, um, than he was. Uh, his explanation of sort of basic economics, economic principles was just so illuminating and helped me understand the world as I saw it, especially as someone who had moved from a country where almost none of the principles were followed uh, to the UK and seeing what made, what made countries fail and uh, what made countries work well. So it's a brilliant book and then I, I started reading more and more of what he'd written and I think that actually more Thomas Owl in the curriculum or would be a good thing for not just the UK but for the US as well. We'll get on the phone to the education secretary <laughs> and get it on there. Um, I want to ask a couple of co kind of more political kind of questions really I guess. The first one is why do you think you were so popular with the conservative base? Um, I think, well, I have been told, and I think that this, this is correct, that I don't speak in cliches, which is helpful for, I sound like I'm plain speaking, at least I hope I'm plain speaking, which is very helpful for communicating very complex, uh, very complex thoughts. And being a conservative is tough because many of the positions we hold are often counterintuitive, which means we have to do a lot of explaining and explaining about, no, actually, this thing that uh, seems really obvious to you is completely wrong and so on. So I think that helped. And I think also people had seen me speak up uh, for others uh, in a way that many politicians had not and kept their head down. And so they saw me as somebody who was uh, not afraid to speak her mind. And that, I think, is always very popular in, in a contest. I'm not necessarily sure it's popular when you start governing. So it's very easy before you run to be, to be popular. But when you start telling the truth in government and being very honest and, and plain speaking, it's not, um, it's not that uh, fun for people who have to hear some of the hard truths about why we can't spend all the money that we would like to spend and why we can't have certain policies. And it's, it's hardest for the people who already agree with you. So you're telling your base that they can't have the thing that they really want is, is the toughest thing to do. Yeah, I've long suspected that there's actually a premium for, for plain talking. I don't understand why so many politicians are so identical. So it's good, it's good oh, to have I know why. Different. It's because when, the minute you say anything that is not in the script, it becomes a, a big story. So, you know, I think, have we got Politico here? So uh, there'll, be something, there'll be something which I've said, which I would assume is a throwaway comment, and then it'll be, it'll be a headline. And, um, and so many people are afraid to move off the script. So it's a real challenge because the incentive is to just stay on message, stay on the script, and don't say anything else. But then people stop believing what we're saying because it all sounds the same and it all sounds like we're being fed, um, being fed lines. So there's a trade-off there. It's one of my favorite sayings is, you know, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. You can be plain speaking and uh, take the hits because what you say will be written up and often sensationalized, or you can not be plain speaking and you don't get the hard time. Uh, and it is very hard when you're constantly sort of uh, sensationalized in that way. But you, and, and you can t uh, you keep your head down and read the lines, but then it's harder to get heard. There's no, there's no easy way. On that front, I'll save the most difficult question for, for last. So the Conservative Party have obviously had a massive 
you could say it's partially enforced U-turn on economic policy in the last uh, few weeks. Um, you know, you've described yourself as a kind of small stater. Um, there's a big debate, a narrative debate about what went wrong with the previous mini, mini budget. And, you know, a lot of progressives are kind of claiming it was the fact that the government were engaging sp specifically in tax cuts, mm. um, as opposed to others arguing it was the scale of the borrowing, interacting with some of the pensions industry problems. Um, do you think the problem with the mini budget was that it went too quickly in a direction you'd like to see, or was it the wrong direction? I think there were loads of things that were happening at the same time, and it just created a perfect storm. So during that leadership contest, I had said that I wasn't getting into a war on, on tax cuts. I felt that we were not in the place to be, to be talking about tax cuts, even though lots of people wanted them. Tax cuts are great for you know, probably people like us, everyone in this room, but you need to convince people, you need to make the argument uh, before you do... Uh, anything that's not strictly in, in, in the script. And I think what went wrong was that the problem everybody had been talking about was the cost of living crisis. And the answer to that was not tax cuts as had been proposed. So there were many things that, that went wrong. The, the, the nature of the tax cuts was not something, hadn't been discussed in cabinet, for example. So it was a surprise even to those of us who, who were in government. The principle of it, I definitely did agree with, but the timing, uh, and the timing given the backdrop, I don't think was right. But also, and this is the point I was making earlier, you need to bring people with you and to do persuading and explaining. And markets are very complex, and if people don't understand what you're doing, even if it's the right thing, it's a waste of time. And I don't think the making people understand what we're doing and why was um, was 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 done properly, and it's a message which um, I would say to uh, think tanks in the UK, like the IEA and even Cato, that we run a risk sometimes of talking to ourselves so much that we forget that a whole load of people don't understand what we're talking about. Talking about tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts doesn't make sense to a lot of my friends who are well-educated, middle-class people. Uh, not everybody knows what the Laffer curve is. Not everybody agrees where the particular points in are, where the, the law of diminishing returns comes in. And simply talking about economic growth without a clear explanation of how something will deliver it it doesn't, um, it doesn't bring people along. And unfortunately, some of the people we didn't bring along were people who were making very, very important decisions in the markets. And once that confidence is gone, it's very hard, even if you are correct, uh, to, fix, to fix things. And it was, it was very upsetting for me seeing what happened because I think that the longer term damage is to the argument that those of us on centre right make about tax cuts and about economic growth in general. So we've gone further back because there'll be many young people who will just have seen, oh, well, if you even just announce tax cuts, bad things happen. We didn't actually do anything. None of those things had gone into had gone into law. So simply talking about it and saying we are going to do this caused the problem. In terms of what we actually did, most of the money was uh, from the, on the energy bailout. That was uh, potentially up to 150 billion. That was way more than anything that we had been talking about in terms of tax cuts and uh, the exciting things in the mini budget that um, made people on the center right happy. So again, there's a lot of conflation about what actually was the root cause of it. Was it the energy bailout? Was it the tax cuts? And that's why um, what the Prime Minister is doing now is really, really important, which is creating stability and creating confidence. Markets are all about confidence. The money we give out is all about confidence. It's a promissory note. Confidence is key. And on the center right, our economic competence is uh, reliant on making sure that people are confident in what we're doing. And we must never forget that. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's just about all we've got time for because that clock is now ticking upwards, which means we're over time. So thank you for being so generous with your time and thank you for coming to Cato this evening. Thank you, Ryan.